the Kennedys, America's unofficial royal family. For a century, they've dazzled the world with their glamour, charisma, and wealth. They had a style about them that America had never seen before, and there seemed to be a sense of boundless optimism. But the crown has been a heavy one to bear, with successive generations suffering heartbreak and loss. It's hard to find in history a family that has suffered as badly as the Kennedys. Airplane crashes, overdoses, assassinations. People talk about the Kennedy curse. How could so much tragedy befall one family? But what has been the effect on the surviving Kennedys? We hear from family, friends, and eyewitnesses, many speaking for the first time on TV. We also reveal unseen letters and hear from the Kennedys themselves. There is always a question of what do you do with tragedy? What do you do with challenges? And do you learn from them? And do you take them on and understand them? These are family members who were violently murdered. People say, well, it's a loss to the country, and no one thinks about the impact on a family. July 16th, 1999. A plane carrying 38-year-old John F. Kennedy Jr., his wife and sister-in-law, takes off from New Jersey and then disappears from radar. All of a sudden, the nation's attention again turns to this plane that's been lost. And they know it's tragic again. And they feel the same sort of emotions that they had felt, the whole country turning again, watching the Kennedy family suffer. Three days later, search teams located the wreckage off the coast of Martha's Vineyard. There were no survivors. Patrick Kennedy is JFK Jr.'s cousin and Ted Kennedy's son. It always seemed in my family that we were haunted by this tragedy of not just my uncle's tragic um, deaths and assassinations, really murders, you know, but then my cousin David overdosing and my cousin John's plane crash. It was just this sense that, you know, we're constantly reminded about tragedy is just around the corner. As the family came to terms with yet another premature death, the public mourned with them. People just said through the years, not again. You just wondered if all the rumors were true that there really was a curse on the Kennedy family. Now, I don't believe in curses, but I think you could justify it in the case of the Kennedy family. The family's American roots were laid down in Boston, Massachusetts. Their original ancestor landed in 1849 after crossing the Atlantic. Kathleen Kennedy Townsend is the eldest daughter of JFK's brother, Bobby. The first Kennedy to arrive um, in the New World, in the United States, was Patrick Kennedy, my great-great-grandfather, who came from New Ross, Ireland. He came during the potato famine. But the rumor has it he really came because he had a crush on a woman. That woman was Bridget Murphy, with whom he'd later have five children. As Irish Catholic immigrants, they were shunned by a Protestant-dominated society. I heard from my grandmother growing up um, about the incredible prejudice against the Irish, um, that there were signs that said, help wanted, no Irish need apply. My family was excluded. It's hard to imagine, given the fact they're so central to the American experience, that the Kennedys were discriminated against and that one of the defining characteristics of my family was the desire to work their way out of the shadows and the margins of society as Irish Catholics. It was the Kennedy's grandson, Joseph, known as Joe Senior, who had laid the foundations of America's most powerful dynasty. At 20, he became an economics student at Harvard University stronghold of Boston's traditional upper class, where anti-Catholic prejudice was rife. He is uh, blackballed from entering the clubs, which are so important to 
uh, for entry into public life effectively in Boston at that time, I think very much spark a sense of resentment and drive in Joe Kennedy to prove that he is able to succeed against the odds effectively. He just couldn't escape that discrimination and he was going to overcome it in any way that he could. And wealth was one of the ways he thought he could overcome it. On so many levels, my grandfather's life was uh, a story of defiance, right? And what that drive makes possible in a human being if they are so driven. By 25, the ambitious, driven Kennedy was the youngest ever head of a US bank and an expert investor. But as well as wealth and status, he also craved influence. He achieved that through marriage to the daughter of Boston's most powerful politician, Mayor John F. Fitzgerald. My great-grandfather, Honey Fitz, was the first Irish-born mayor of Boston. And he had a great singing voice, and he loved to sing Sweet Adeline, and he loved to go out and meet people. In 1906, Joe began dating the mayor's teenage daughter, Rose. Rose was the apple of her father's eye. She attended um, private schools, very bright, bright young woman, and her father was very, very proud of her. The couple married in 1914 and had their first child, Joe Jr., a year later. Eight more would follow. Joe had grand ambitions for them all, while Rose set the highest standards. My grandmother was very strict. She would come to our house and she would tell us, you know, how to eat, how to speak, when to go to bed. My parents would ask us to write her thank you notes. She'd return those thank you notes with red lines, correcting our grammar and our, our diction and our, our spelling. So I didn't have a really warm feeling about my grandmother. From the start, Joe dreamt of his eldest son running for high political office. But if he was going to support him, he'd need more money. So he took a gamble. He left his secure banking job and headed for Los Angeles. Just as Hollywood is coming to the fore uh, in the 1920s and 30s in the motion picture industry, Joe Kennedy goes there to be an executive producer, and he learns the ropes. My grandfather was the head of three studios in Hollywood, so he was very well aware of image and the importance of image. As a movie mogul, Joe Kennedy enjoyed power as well as perks. As Rose stayed at home with their young family, he conducted a string of affairs with famous actresses. Joe Kennedy was a notorious philanderer, brought home his mistress, Gloria Swanson, to his home in front of his children. Uh, they knew that he was having affairs. And Gloria Swanson said this wonderful thing in her autobiography. She said, was Rose a fool or was just a better actress than I was? By the end of the 1920s, Joe had made an estimated $5 million from banking and movies. But thanks to a series of shrewd property investments, that soon grew rapidly. In the 1930s, Joe Kennedy was named the fourth richest man in America. I think his fortune was worth somewhere around, in those days about two to three hundred million dollars, which in today's money would be in the billions. This wealth bought him the influence he craved. In 1932, he helped bankroll the election of Democrat President Franklin D. Roosevelt. And six years later, he got his reward. Roosevelt appointed him ambassador to Britain, the first Catholic to hold the post. I'm looking forward with great anticipation to taking up my duties here. But what about your family of nine, Mr. Kennedy? Not wishing to make the housing problem of England any more complicated, I'm bringing them over in installments. When he became ambassador to Great Britain, he thought that he had really arrived because here he was in knee breeches, seeing the Queen of England, no less, and hobnobbing with British aristocracy. And this gave him great satisfaction. But within two years, the family were on their way back home, and Joe Kennedy's dreams of shaping American politics were in ruins. In 
1938, Joe Kennedy was America's ambassador in London, and his family were British media celebrities. But when war broke out a year later, relations with his new country would sour. Joe Kennedy was absolutely convinced that Hitler was going to win. He just said, within two weeks, Hitler will be in Buckingham Palace. He absolutely believed it. And he also believed this was not America's war. And that was because he knew his sons were raised in such a way they would sign up. And so as the war came on, he wanted to appease Hitler to try to avoid war. This did not go over well, either in England or the United States, and that was the end of both his diplomatic career and it was also the end of Joe Kennedy's career aspirations to be president of the United States. With his own political prospects in tatters, Joe Kennedy headed back home and transferred all his grand ambitions to his eldest son. He was determined that Joe Jr. would become the future president of the United States. Joe Kennedy Sr.'s favorite was Joe Jr. Uh, because he was the first and he was the golden boy and he followed all of Joe and Rose's rules and he was so successful. He was a good student. He was a star athlete. Air Cadet Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. reports for preliminary training. With other college men, he'll try for Navy wing. When America joined World War II, Joe Jr. enlisted as a Navy pilot. His father viewed it as the ideal career move for a future president. But he also worried about potential obstacles on the way to the White House. Chief among his concerns was his eldest daughter, Rosemary. When she was born, the doctor was late and the midwife more or less pushed the baby back in, didn't want the baby to be born until the doctor was there. And the baby was starved of oxygen, which meant that Rosemary had a mental age of about 11 for the rest of her life. As a youngster, Rosemary was keen to enjoy the same social life as her friends, but fitting in was difficult. My father used to tell me that when they went to these social parties in Palm Beach and the like, my uncle Jack would see his sister Rosemary kind of shunned because she was different. And my father said, your Uncle Jack used to go and sit beside her or stand and talk to her instead of all the fancy people at the parties. Because of her intellectual afflictions and learning disabilities, she also suffered from quite a bit of anxiety. Uh, and she began to lash out. Uh, her temper tantrums became more violent and they would have to call in a doctor to try to sedate her. For her parents, such conduct was not only embarrassing, but potentially damaging to the family. Joe and Rose did not want imperfection in their children. During that time, there was a stigma attached to having children with mental illness or intellectual disabilities. And they didn't want anyone to know because it might affect the chances for their sons and their careers. In 1940, Joe arranged for Rosemary to attend a summer camp in Massachusetts. He hoped the experience would improve her behavior. But instead, it worsened. Terry Marotta's mother and aunt were in charge of the camp. My mother and aunt were frantic about her behavior because they felt that, that her presence was compromising the safety and well-being of everyone else in the camp. Soon, the camp's owners even feared she'd become pregnant while staying there. Rosemary was very beautiful. Some said that she was the most beautiful of the Kennedy women. She was tallish for her time. She was voluptuous. And Rosemary is wandering off into the woods at night, and um, they become extremely fearful that something is going to happen to Rosemary, and they can't spend all their time watching her. After three weeks at the camp, matters came to a head. Terry's mother, Caroline Sullivan, wrote to Rose saying her daughter would have to leave. This is the letter now seen for the first time. She was so difficult of adjustment in our group of normal young children that for the well-being of everyone, I found it necessary to give my own constant attention to her. The situation turned out to be so impossible that after giving it every effort, in a thoroughly fair trial, it seemed necessary to request from you the end of her stay at camp. 
Rosemary left soon afterwards and wrote back to Terry's mother. I'm so sorry you had to lose me. It's not my fault, darlings. Have everybody write me a short little note. I've been crying over it. I know you all loved me so. I'm going to be a bit tired from all the studying this summer and the fall. My love to all, Rosemary. After Rosemary's removal from the camp, Joe Kennedy decided on drastic action. Without Rose's approval, he paid doctors to perform a new type of brain surgery on their 23-year-old daughter. In November 1941, she underwent a prefrontal lobotomy. The procedure at the time required drilling into the side of the skull. The doctors uh, strapped Rosemary down on the table and they asked her to count back from 100 and to sing nursery rhymes. And when she could no longer do those things, they knew that the operation was complete. But that operation was mishandled. The surgeon damaged a larger part of Rosemary's brain than was necessary. She couldn't walk or talk. She was incontinent. She never could take care of herself again. It was a tragic, tragic experiment that went terribly wrong. After the operation, the severely disabled Rosemary was sent to live in a psychiatric institution. It would be another 20 years before her mother paid her a visit. Rosemary was not there at Thanksgiving when the family gathered. And the first letter that Rose wrote to all of the children after Thanksgiving, Rosemary's name was deleted from the letterhead. Rosemary's effective expulsion from the family established a Kennedy code, one that future generations felt they had to live by. My grandfather, I think, set the tone when the tragedy of my Aunt Rosemary's lobotomy um, happened, and he banished her from the family, he himself not seeing her at all for the rest of his life. I think that sent a lot of implicit messages about how to handle um, these issues um, and to handle them in secret and keep them compartmentalized. Soon after Rosemary's operation, Jack Kennedy received the news he'd been waiting for. Determined to follow in his brother Joe's footsteps, he joined the Navy and later captained a torpedo boat in the South Pacific. It was here that he nearly lost his life. He was in Blackett Strait in the Solomon Islands in the dead of night. He had gone to try to track and uh, fire torpedoes at a Japanese convoy, running on one engine only so as to be quiet. And they are literally plowed into by a Japanese destroyer. All 14 men on board were declared missing and presumed dead. But one week later, Jack, along with 10 of his 13 crew, was found alive on the Solomon Islands. On September 12, 1943, he wrote to his parents from the South Pacific. The letter is now owned by his nephew, Patrick. He writes um, about losing, you know, two of his crew members. And uh, it was devastating, obviously, in the, but he's talking about going back out. And uh, he talks about um, lost most of my old crew, except for a couple who are being sent home. And I'm extremely glad for that. First of all, that not that nice? Obviously, he's so happy that uh, the men that he was leading have a chance to go home to their families. Well, at the very end, it's kind of funny about how he says, uh, it's uh, hot as the devil here. Hence, the letter is blurred, uh, you know, meaning he's perspiring over the uh, letter. I just think this is really neat insight into my uncle. Jack Kennedy was awarded a Purple Heart for gallantry. Now hailed as a war hero, his popularity soared. And for the first time, his father began to view him rather than his older brother, Joe, as a potential president that must have stuck in the crawl of Joe Jr. because here was this goof-off brother now being the great hero of the Navy and of his family. Joe
Joe Jr.'s determination to regain his position as the favored son would prove catastrophic. In 1944, he was due to return home from active service in Europe, but he then agreed to take part in one last bombing mission, Operation Aphrodite. With Operation Aphrodite, it involved B-24 large military aircraft that were about to retire that were packed with huge amounts of explosives and they would fly up to 2,000 feet, and then the pilots would jettison out of the airplane with parachutes, and these planes would be remotely controlled and then blow up specific targets. Despite a warning that the electrics on the plane might be faulty and could detonate the bomb accidentally, Joe Jr. chose to go ahead with the mission. There's a very strong argument that one of the reasons Joe Jr. took the decision was because, at some level, he was jealous of Jack's PT-109 heroism. And because they were so competitive, Joe wanted to go one step further. His father said, don't be a hero, you've done everything. And he said, I I've just got one more mission. The mission took place on 12th of August, 1944. That evening, 10-year-old Michael Muttit was playing with his brother outside their home near England's Suffolk coast. We could hear the Mustang fighters and then we heard a heavier sound coming along, turned to see a Liberator bomber. As Michael watched the plane pass, disaster struck. The Liberator it, it disappeared in an enormous fireball. The burning wreckage falling away appeared as tentacles on an octopus. Joe Kennedy Jr. died instantly in the explosion, caused by a suspected electrical fault. Joseph B. Kennedy Jr. Uh, was a, a war hero, died over the skies of Europe. What a sacrifice, but what a noble sacrifice trying to fight the Nazis and fascism. Although Joe Sr. lost his favorite son, his burning ambition remained. He now pinned all his political hopes on Jack. They had long ignored any of Jack's um, abilities and qualities because they were so focused on Joe. So when Joe Jr. died, they had to look at Jack, and Jack had to stand up and, and take on that role, which was a tremendous burden. But just as he began steering Jack's political career, another family member threatened to derail it. 23-year-old Kathleen Kennedy, also known as Kick, was living in England and serving with the American Red Cross. Kick was vivacious and had a lot of guts and spirit. And that apparently was unusual for most of the British who were a little more restrained. And so I think people were attracted to that life, liveliness. Kick had begun seeing a wealthy English lord, Peter Fitzwilliam. But in her family's eyes, the relationship was wildly inappropriate. Not only was he a Protestant, he was married with a daughter. Kick's parents were furious. Rose, in particular, was incandescent with rage. She said to Kick, if you marry this man, you will be dis disinherited and you will not speak to another family member again. Kick, once again, was determined to defy her family and to defy her faith. She then said, I've lost my mother, but I'm going to get my father on side. In May 1948, Kick arranged to meet her father in France, where he was on business. She and her new boyfriend chartered a plane from London, then stopped off in Paris to refuel. Peter and Kick went into Paris to meet friends for lunch. They came back late, by which time a storm had been brewing. At first, the pilot refused to resume the flight, arguing that it was too dangerous. But eventually, Peter talked him round. It's quite extraordinary that Peter Fitzwilliam persuaded the pilot to make that flight. The pilot was quite adamant. They were too late, they were flying into the eye of the storm. The speculation may be that Peter paid him off. The plane took off three hours later than expected. And just as the pilot had warned, they hit the storm. The 
plane crashed north of the Ardèche Mountains, killing everyone on board. Joe, he was absolutely devastated. He wrote on a scrap of paper, I can only think that God must have wanted someone as wonderful as Kick. Joe flew to the foot of the mountains in France, identified the body. She had a habit of kicking off her shoes, and he said she looked incredibly peaceful lying there with her shoes kicked off. But even in the throes of mourning, Joe Senior was thinking about the potential damage to the family name. He was determined to keep key details of the accident from public view. Nobody wanted this story to get out. That kick was with a married man flying off for a dirty weekend. So a person was sent to clear all Kick's belongings from Peter's house, and they concocted a story that Kick just hitched a ride with a group of friends. So the secret was kept, and it was kept out of the press. Kick herself was whitewashed out of the Kennedy family because of the disgrace that Rose felt that she brought. It was a guilty secret, but they were determined to keep quiet at all costs, no matter what the impact on the other family members. With two siblings dead and a third institutionalized, Jack Kennedy threw himself into politics with renewed vigor. In 1953, he was elected to the US Senate. But both his parents believed the American public would never accept a presidential hopeful who was single. So, when he introduced them to his new girlfriend, Jacqueline Bouvier, their advice was instant, marry her. Joe Kennedy and Rose Kennedy were immediately taken with Jackie because they realized she was a perfect match for their son. Uh, she was great in public, she was beautiful, and she was from uh, the elite of society. The couple married in September 1953, and, as ever, it was Joe Kennedy who took charge of the proceedings. Jackie thought that she was having a wedding Joe Sr. thought he was having a wedding slash campaign fundraiser, and he won out. She didn't even get to pick her dress, and she later complained that she looked like a lampshade. In November 1957, Jackie gave birth to a daughter, Caroline. Appearance-wise, JFK now had everything necessary for high political office, youth, energy, good looks, a beautiful wife, and a happy family but much of it was a facade. Like his father before him, Jack Kennedy had become a serial adulterer. The Kennedy family were raised in a very interesting way. Rose was there to look after the girls. They were encouraged to be well-behaved, to go to mass, to be um, perfect daughters, sisters. The boys were raised by Joe, and there was a sexual double standard. They were encouraged to be macho, to sleep around. So right from the start, it was split down the middle on a gender basis. With his womanizing kept secret, JFK's career continued to flourish. In November 1960, he was elected president. The country had never seen anybody like that before. He was young, he was handsome. Uh, he had a beautiful wife, Jackie. Uh, they, they appeared to be royal in many ways. And they were sexy. And they were full of enthusiasm for the future. And it really was a new era in America, ushered in by this family. It was so cold during the inauguration. And then afterwards, um, uh, we were lucky enough to go to the Treasury Department to watch the parade. But what was really stunning, of course, was President Kennedy's speech, because they thought it was one of the great inaugural addresses. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It was a very exciting time to be a part of our family. But within months, the head of that family Joe Senior became a shadow of his once formidable self. 
My grandfather had a stroke in 1961. So from 1961 till he died, I mostly knew him as a person who couldn't move very much or couldn't speak. But my father and my uncles, Jack and Teddy, would always go and see him. And, and I think showed enormous respect and love for their father. Without his father to advise him, Jack Kennedy faced huge challenges in early 60s America. With racial problems and Cold War tensions, the country looked to its president to show strong character. But in his private life, he displayed anything but. Priscilla McMillan was one of his foreign policy advisors. She witnessed his relentless womanizing and was once on the receiving end. He was cute. You know, he was very cute. But I said to him, if you weren't a married Catholic politician, you know, I might take you more seriously. And he said, a little late, isn't it? I, I didn't completely like him. I mean, he gave off a lot of light and quickness, you know, joking, but not warmth. Despite being one of the few women to turn JFK down, Priscilla became a friend and confidant. Well, I asked him, why do you risk it all with running after girls? And he paused and he said, because I can't help it. Just as JFK risked his marriage and reputation, he gambled with his safety. In November 1963, he was scheduled to visit Dallas, Texas, as part of his re-election campaign. But with mounting opposition to his stance on civil rights, he was advised to steer clear. Dallas was a hotbed of right-wing hostility toward Kennedy and his administration, and was known to be a dangerous place to go to. They were right-wing extremists. They were well known to the police and to the FBI. They were rich enough to by full-page uh, newspaper advertisements. Despite receiving death threats, JFK decided to go ahead, taking Jackie with him. He also made a series of risky decisions about the security arrangements. He specifically gave instructions to the Secret Service not to ride on the sides of his uh, automobile. He said he did not want to bubble. He wanted to be exposed to the a population, but his recklessness led to the Secret Service not taking this kind of uh, measures that they should have taken. During the drive through the city, JFK asked Jackie to remove her sunglasses so onlookers could see her face. They would be his last words to his wife. At 12.30 on November 22, 1963, JFK was shot dead after two years and 36 days in office. The assassination left America in deep shock. And for the third time in 20 years, its first family in mourning. After my uncle died, I think my father did something really important. He wrote all of us children from the White House. Uh, and he said, dear Kathleen, you seem to understand that Jack died and was buried today. As the oldest of the Kennedy grandchildren, you have a special responsibility. Be kind to others and work for your country. Love, Daddy. Kathleen's father, Bobby, would later tell an aide, you had better pretend you don't know me. Everyone connected to me seems jinxed. But whatever they said in private, the family showed a different face to the public. At this funeral and others, they respected an iron rule that JFK's parents had instilled decades earlier. Kennedys don't cry. The rule was you, you didn't cry, so to speak. You didn't show weakness, because I was seen as weakness. That's the way it was back then. I think it's important that Today, we reflect on the fact that we've made some progress, but not a lot. Thank you very much. Next, after one Kennedy assassination, 
another. That's when the television lights went on, blinding me. I was shaking violently, and Bob got shot. The nation mourns, the world grieves. The man who became 35th president less than three years ago is dead. John F. Kennedy's assassination at the age of 46 was the fourth tragedy to affect the family in 20 years. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. In 1963, when President Kennedy is assassinated, it has a devastating impact not only upon the nation but on the family as well. The idea that the family is now going to need to regroup uh, and a new, a new leader, uh, Robert Kennedy, who is now going to assume a responsibility not only for his own growing brood of children, but also for the president's own two children. Bobby Kennedy had served his late brother as America's attorney general. Even before the assassination, the string of disasters affecting the family had haunted him. On hearing the news of the shooting, he told a reporter, I thought they'd get one of us, but Jack never worried about it. I thought it would be me. A year after John Kennedy's assassination, Bobby said, and I'm quoting, somebody up there doesn't like us. Um, so he started thinking about uh, a curse without using the word. Although devastated by his brother's violent death, Bobby refused to let it destroy the family's ambitions to be leaders in public life. Shortly after the assassination, he penned a message to his then 12-year-old daughter, Kathleen. It was all about be kind to others, work for your country, help your family, and love. And I think the fact that he did that helped our family move, move on and say, what is our responsibility? It's not to look you know, what happened exactly. It's to say, what could we still contribute? By the time of JFK's death, his youngest brother was also in politics. Ted Kennedy had been elected to the US Senate just a year earlier. My father was absolutely a brother in arms with his brother, Jack. They were as tight as can be. This family was completely traumatized. Not only had they just lost Jack, my father was suffering. My mother has spoken to me about how absolutely shattered my father was. But Ted Kennedy also resolved to honor his brother's legacy. On June 19th, 1964, he helped vote through the controversial Civil Rights Act championed by the late president. That same night, he was due to fly to the Democratic Party convention in Springfield, Massachusetts. Flying alongside him were three fellow passengers, including his close political aide, Edward Moss. At 10.30 p.m., the pilot took off, despite the bad weather warnings. But, just as it neared its destination, the plane hit dense fog. Misfortune strikes the Kennedy family once again. Senator Edward M. Kennedy was seriously injured when his private plane crashed in the woods near Southampton, Massachusetts. Both the pilot and Kennedy's aide, Edward Moss, were killed. The three others on board survived, although Kennedy himself sustained a fractured spine, punctured lung, and internal bleeding. The risk of losing yet another son to another tragedy so soon after losing the president causes great shock to the nation and to the family. Robert Kennedy rushes to his brother's side and remarks that there are more Kennedys than there is of trouble, which I think comes to symbolize the idea that the storm clouds are gathering on the family. And this is seen as uh, uh, a growing tragedy for the family as well as for the nation. It was a miracle that he even survived uh, several broken vertebrae and almost paralyzed, had to be dragged from the plane. 
How are you feeling, Senator? Okay. Good luck, well, Ted. Okay. Glad to see you. Be back up. No, He's back to see you before too long. An investigation later blamed pilot error. Coming so soon after his brother's assassination, there was huge public sympathy for the young senator. But some questioned why he'd chosen to fly when the weather and visibility was so poor. It's a fair portrayal of most of the Kennedys to uh, skirt rules or if not outright break them, go around them. If you're obeying all the rules, you're missing all the fun. Ted Kennedy's reputation as a rule breaker was in stark contrast to that of his devoutly religious brother, Bobby. As the country's top law officer, he was viewed as serious and sober. By the late 60s, he felt ready to follow in JFK's footsteps. I am announcing today my candidacy for the presidency of the United States. As well as the name, he had the credentials. He also took a hard line against organized crime. Robert Kennedy paints a grim picture of the rise of lawlessness under the Cosa Nostra, or Mafia. You can have a lot of uh, tough people call up witnesses, uh, poor businessmen or poor uh, members of the union who can't afford to protect themselves, have them intimidate these people, but you can't come before this committee and answer any questions, can you, Mr. Glimpho? But in taking on the Mafia, Bobby made himself and his family targets for revenge. The uh, mob threatened to throw acid in my eyes and the eyes of my brothers who were at Our, Our Lady Victory School. And so when all the other kids could leave the school at 3 o'clock when the bell rang, we had to go up to the principal's office and wait till my mother came to pick us up. Despite the dangers, Bobby pressed on with his campaign to be president. On June the 5th, he attended a party at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles where the results of the Californian primary elections were to be announced. Thank you very much. A win would take him one step closer to becoming the Democrats' presidential candidate. One of his aides, Paul Schrade, was with him as the final votes were counted. At that time, the vote had turned around and everything was going crazy. And uh, we took phone calls, and he put out phone calls. We kept watching television and, uh, and until uh, quite late. As counting continued, it became clear that Bobby was pulling ahead. Shortly after midnight came the announcement that the 42-year-old senator had won. My thanks to all of you, and now it's on to Chicago, and let's win there. Following his speech, Kennedy made his way to another part of the hotel to hold press interviews. But just as he and his supporters celebrated victory, a gunman stepped from the crowd. That's when the television lights went on, blinding me. And I got shot. I, I didn't know I'd been shot. I thought I was being electrocuted because I was shaking violently. And, and uh, Bob got shot. Around 26 hours later, he died in hospital as a result of his wounds. The gunman, arrested at the scene, was Sehan Sehan, a Palestinian who claimed he'd acted in protest at Kennedy's support for Israel. The first assassination was a tragedy. The second assassination was a tragedy and a clear message that was not lost on the rest of the Kennedys. And they certainly lived in fear of violence from then on. All I knew were bulletproof vests in our closet. In case someone came to the house to shoot us, we'd have bulletproof vests. Like, that's not normal. Robert left behind him not only children, but also a pregnant wife. Ted was now the leader of the Kennedy clan, which was to Of all the Kennedy brothers, only the youngest, Ted, was now left. After my uncle Bobby was uh, murdered, my father was shattered. 
He was just blown up inside. But there was this feeling that he couldn't get help because that would be the end of his political career because there's such a stigma on mental health care, frankly. As the standard bearer for the Kennedy name, Ted had much to live up to, but he knew it. Ted Kennedy certainly felt the pressure most of all, I think. All of a sudden, he is now faced with the daunting prospect of having to pick up the Kennedy family mantle as well as the dynastic political mantle. And this is one which he struggles with, I think, for many years to come. My father should have, in my view, been in therapy after his brothers were killed. He suffered tremendously. He self-medicated, drank a lot to medicate this post-traumatic stress. In 1969, Ted Kennedy's personal problems would lead to a very public fall from grace. On July 19th, just 13 months after Bobby's assassination, he walked into a police station on Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts, to report an accident. Teddy Kennedy went to a cookout at this cottage on Chappaquiddick. After several hours, Kennedy left. With him was a 28-year-old girl, Mary Jo Kopechny. Kennedy told police he'd lost control of his car while driving across a narrow bridge on Chappaquiddick Island 10 hours earlier. It then plunged into the river, landing upside down in six feet of water. I parked to the side of the bridge. My other police officer had arrived, and I contacted him to call the fire department and get the scuba diver over. The diver arrived at the scene 20 minutes later. He went under, and he came up to me, uh, telling me that there's a body in there. He worked his way out of the car and up to me, I uh, had her laying on my lap uh, for a while. Police identified the body as that of campaign worker and singleton, Mary Jo Kopechny, who had been at the party with Ted Kennedy the night before. The so-called Chappaquiddick incident created world headlines. Not only had disaster befallen the Kennedys once again, this time a family member was at fault and suspected of trying to deceive the authorities. When Ted drove off of a bridge, thereby killing his passenger, and then not reporting it for many, many hours, leading people to believe that he was somehow involved in the cover-up of her death. The fact that he did not report the accident, the suggestion that he was out partying in this strange situation, a married man, is, had a pregnant wife at home, uh, three young children. What was he doing with these young women? Kennedy's decision to wait until morning before telling the police also fueled rumors he'd been drunk at the wheel. I think he had been drinking heavily. You know, was he legally drunk or not? We'll never know. With his story under mounting scrutiny and criticism, he went on TV in a bid to save his political career and family name. All kinds of scrambled thoughts went through my mind during this period including such questions as whether some awful curse did actually hang over all the Kennedys. My father was in real trouble, and, and because people don't talk about mental health issues, they, they felt there was no way to talk to him, and the society shunned him. I'm convinced if he had gotten the help he needed, you know, Obviously, the tragedy of Chappaquiddick would not have happened. People forgave him for Chappaquiddick. He was still JFK's brother, Bobby's brother. People wanted to believe in him. People loved him. They loved his family. Kennedy later pleaded guilty to leaving the scene of an accident and received a two-month suspended jail sentence. And although he always denied claims that alcohol caused the crash, the continuing suspicion ended any ambitions he had of occupying the White House. It must be a terrible 
situation to be born into a political family in which somehow your life is considered a failure if you don't become president of the United States. Next, a new generation of Kennedys emerges, but can their family's reputation survive? William Kennedy Smith, the prime suspect in an alleged rape at the family's Palm Beach estate. After such a hopeful start, the 1960s was a dark decade for the Kennedys. For the generation who came of age in the 70s, there would be no let up. One of the great tragedies of the Kennedy family is the sense that the Lost Boys generation, the sons in particular of Robert Kennedy and Ted Kennedy, are seen to be rudderless. And as a result, they go off the rails. In 1993, Bobby's son, Joseph, was involved in a car crash that left his girlfriend unable to walk. Also in the car was his brother, David. While being treated for serious back injuries, he became addicted to the painkiller morphine, an addiction that would later kill him. By all indications, David was a, a very sweet-natured individual. Bobby Kennedy's fourth child had a very, very close bond with his father. By the time of his overdose death, there is a great sense of outpouring grief towards the family uh, by the American people. But that sympathy was to be severely tested. The reason? A fresh scandal involving William Kennedy Smith, son of JFK's sister, Jean. William Kennedy Smith, the prime suspect in an alleged rape at the family's Palm Beach estate. In 1991, the young medical student turned himself into the Palm Beach police, who were investigating claims of a serious sexual assault. It was one of the first court cases that was actually covered on television. It had all the ingredients of a Kennedy tragedy in the making in terms of the appeal of it all. As awful as it was, you couldn't turn you away from it. On the night of March 29th, 1991, Kennedy Smith went to a nightclub where he met 29-year-old Patricia Bowman. The two later returned to his mansion for drinks. The next day, Bowman claimed she'd been raped. So the family, as it has a long tradition of doing, comes together in time of crisis. An allegation against William Kennedy Smith is effectively an allegation against the whole family. And if you take on one, you take on all. Backed by a top legal team, Kennedy Smith pleaded not guilty. In court, his alleged victim faced hostile questioning. My first statement, sir, I'd been raped, I'd been up, I was a I mess. That, and they please. kept asking me the to give them is, more information. Each time no, sir, it's not a speech, it's so. the truth. When Kennedy Smith took the stand, he admitted to having consensual sex with Bowman, but he also questioned her mental state at the time. She got very, very upset, and she told me to get the hell off of her. And what did she do? And she hit me with her hand, and she started shaking and crying, and she said, and you don't even want me. The trial ended with a not guilty verdict, but it would leave a lasting mark on the family name. Well, I think the Kennedy brand was suffering even before the rape trial of William Kennedy Smith. But I think that trial, with all its terrible display of sexual debauchery, really put a, an end to the Kennedy brand as a, uh, a brand that could go on and, and become president again. For William's grandmother, Rose, the trial had been difficult to bear. Throughout their marriage, she and husband Joe had lost four of their nine children and witnessed misfortune befall several others. Now, their grandchildren were seemingly succumbing to the Kennedy curse. Rose lived to be 104, and she would be battered by one tragedy after the next. And just about the time that Rose would think she had recovered from the grief, another tragedy would hit. My grandmother kind of spoke through the medium of religion. She knew 
she needed something to hold her together. And church and her faith held her together and in doing so held our family together. We cannot always understand the ways of Almighty God, but we know his great goodness and his love. And we go on our way, not looking backwards to the past, but we shall carry on with courage. But just two years after Rose's death, another loss. This time, it was Michael, son of former Senator Bobby, killed in a skiing accident in Colorado at the age of 39. It always seemed in my family that we were haunted by this tragedy. My cousin David overdosing, and my cousin Michael dying from a ski accident. There was just this sense that we are constantly reminded about, you know, tragedy is just around the corner. Despite the increasing list of traumas, there was another family member who was deemed most likely to succeed. Following his father's death in 1963, John Fitzgerald Kennedy Jr., known as John John, had captured America's heart. He learned of his father's assassination hours after it happened. He attended the funeral on his third birthday. Well, it is a famous picture of John saluting his father, and I think that it comes very much from his mother, who understood the importance of the occasion, the fact that this was a real tragedy. And that kind of grace certainly helped our country, but also helped our nation. In the years afterwards, the public followed his every move. John F. Kennedy Jr. was in many ways America's prince. He'd been born uh, during his father's time as president-elect. He'd grown up uh, as a young boy in the White House. Uh, Americans had fallen in love with him as a child and was a young man with a great future. You know, JFK sort of was like his dad. He also had a way of making you feel that you were the only person on the planet in that moment that you were speaking to him. He was accessible the way a politician is accessible. After a successful law and media career, JFK Jr. began showing an increasing interest in entering politics. JFK was a beacon of hope to the public who always felt that he was next in line. But just as America's golden boy seemed set to follow in his father's footsteps, the country awoke to an all too familiar headline. The Kennedy home in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. By the mid-1990s, the American public were used to hearing about the so-called curse afflicting those who lived there. But there was one Kennedy who carried the family's hopes and ambitions for the future. John F. Kennedy Jr. in many ways was a figure that Americans loved. He was seen in many ways to be above politics. You could equate him in many ways as being the American Diana. JFK Jr. had the glamour of his father and he had the poise of his mother. And combining all of those attributes, people just looked at him and thought, here's somebody who has a future. John Jr. qualified as a lawyer, worked as a publisher, and dated a string of Hollywood stars. In 1996, he married fashion PR Carolyn Bessette, with the US media giving it the same attention as a royal wedding. When JFK met Carolyn Bessette, then people began to think, all right, now we see something here. You know, that this, this relationship could actually be one that will end up in the White House. In a very real sense. JFK Jr. did little to discourage the idea. Politics was in his blood. He'd even appeared on the campaign trail for his uncle, Senator Ted Kennedy. Over a quarter century ago, my father stood before you to accept the nomination for the presidency of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. In 1998, 
JFK Jr. qualified as a pilot. On July 16, 1999, he boarded his Piper Saratoga light aircraft in New Jersey, along with his wife and sister-in-law. They were bound for Cape Cod for the wedding of his cousin, Rory Kennedy, with a stop at Martha's Vineyard on the way. He had just had a cast taken off his foot because he had broken his ankle. He was in no condition physically to fly a plane in any case because, you know, the plane had to be manipulated both by legs and arms. And there would be no one with him at the controls. One experienced pilot who had just flown from Cape Cod tried to warn him not to take off. Another pilot, Kyle Bailey, abandoned his own plans to make the same journey. The weather conditions that evening, it was a very clear sky, blue skies, but we had, you know, haze, heat, humidity, and there was reduced visibility. Although he'd recently qualified, JFK Jr. was still only permitted to fly when visibility was good. He also had only limited experience of operating the controls of the Saratoga. When JFK Jr. took off, I saw the airplane depart. I pretty much didn't know what to expect. I kind of thought, you know, if he is solo, he might have difficulty, obviously, with the conditions up there. On takeoff at 8.39 p.m., he checked in with air traffic control, but there was no further contact. An hour later, the plane crashed nose first into the Atlantic Ocean. Two days later, Coast Guard said they'd given up hope of finding anyone alive. Rescue teams later pinpointed the plane wreckage. They then recovered three bodies from the ocean floor. Divers located the wreckage and the victims in about 120 feet of water off the tip of Martha's Vineyard. Now that they have located the remains of John Kennedy Jr., his wife Carolyn, and her sister Lauren Bessett, they were able to find some closure to this awful tragedy. The death of John F. Kennedy Jr. can be best equated here in the UK with the outpouring of grief that was received when Princess Diana was killed in Paris. The idea that you've seen someone who was the embodiment of grace and glamour and style and sophistication uh, being killed in tragic circumstances and many, many years before uh, their time. When John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy were assassinated, the tragedy seemed commensurate with their position in politics. They were very important people. When fate picks out their children, when that happens, it seems as though fate was maliciously destroying the Kennedys with glee. The public's fascination with the Kennedys continues unabated, as does the family's reputation for power and influence. In many people's eyes, America was at its greatest during those thousand days of President Kennedy's time in office. And there is, I think, a hankering in some parts uh, to return to those glory days of America's uh, yesterday, effectively. As the latest generation looks to make its own mark on America, the series of family misfortunes continues to cast its shadow. Since taking part in this program, Kathleen Kennedy Townsend has suffered another tragedy. Crews are out searching Chesapeake Bay for 40-year-old Maeve Kennedy McKean and her eight-year-old son Gideon. They were last seen on Thursday afternoon, drifting in a canoe several miles offshore. Maeve, daughter of Kathleen and granddaughter of Bobby, disappeared with her son on April the 2nd, 2020. In a Facebook post, her husband, David McKean, said they had climbed into the vessel intending to retrieve a ball, but then got pushed by wind or tide into the open bay. Police launched a rescue operation, but when they found the canoe, it was capsized and several miles from the shore. Maeve's body was recovered on April the 6th, her son's two days later.
there are currently more than 100 members of the Kennedy family, all descended from their first ancestor to arrive in Boston in 1849. Theirs is a past rich with achievement, but it's also overshadowed by heartbreak. Earlier generations overcame huge odds to gain status, wealth, and power. But in striving for success, they paid a heavy price. They come from that background of humiliation and powerlessness. And as compensation for those feelings, they develop this family mythology of invulnerability so that they could get away with things that other people couldn't. But they couldn't get away with it because destiny, fate, will ultimately catch up with you. So the rules broke them, ultimately. Yet the Kennedys remain America's most famous family. Their peak influence has passed, but it may one day return. I think that a lot of members of my family will continue my family's legacy, not just through running for office, but through other ways of giving back to their country. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. The work goes on, the cause endures, the hope still lives, and the dream shall never die. This family's name is Kennedy.